Hello folks, Scott Phillips here. Welcome back to my channel. And today we are bound for fantasy with the second book in the original Earthsea trilogy by Ursula K. Le Guin. And then, like I usually like to do on this channel then, is to talk a little bit about some of the artwork inspired by that book. And this was uh, to be my second installment in February Fantasy Stories, which is a booktube event that was created last year by the bookish Bryants for the month of February. I know we're already a week into March here. I've fallen a little behind, but I don't feel so bad about that because I'm not the only one. But I'm letting it spill into March, and that's going to be my new tradition. But to keep the tradition going, since the Bookish Bryants were not able to host it this year, their own booktube event, um, for a number of reasons, Steve Donahue decided that he could step up and host it this year. Uh, so um, uh, if you know Steve, uh, you may recognize him from time to time as being a bit of a Gandalf-like figure who will drop in on our individual hobbit holes here and try to encourage us to embark on a grand adventure uh, with him. And so that's what he was doing with February Fantasy Stories. He outlined four weeks that you might consider breaking it into subgenres uh, and to keep you going week after week, and also for a variety, so that you didn't get, uh, I guess, pigeonholed into one type of, uh, one type of fantasy story. So uh, week one was to be swords and sorcery, and I put up a video uh, on the first story of the adventures of uh, Fafford and the Grey Mauser. So that I got. So check off week one for me. I did that. Then I started to fall behind like everybody else involved in February fantasy stories this year. And uh, that the second week was going to be epic fantasy. Third week was going to be what Steve was calling an installment, where you might, maybe you've been reading a series of fantasy stories or books and have set them aside for a while, and now you can pick one up and get jump back into the middle of it. And then uh, the fourth and final week was going to be contemporary fantasy. Well, uh, like I say, the second week was getting away from me, and epic fantasy tends to be kind of longer anyway, so it would it'd be a little more investment in a reading time that I was finding quickly that I didn't have. So the third week was coming up, uh, installment, and I w started to think, well, maybe I can combine those two weeks into one. Uh, it, it was only a couple of years ago that I read the very first uh, Earthsea book, um, A Wizard of Earthsea. The Wizard of Earthsea. I'd never read it before, although I bought a, a, a three-volume set, the Bantam set, in uh, 1975 when they came out, because I, I liked the cover art quite a bit. But I had never read it until a couple years ago I read that first book. So for installment week here for February Fantasy Stories, I thought, ah, not only is it an installment that I haven't read yet of a series, but it's also... Uh, a book of epic fantasy. So I thought I could kind of cheat a little bit here and combine those two. Then, as I usually do for these videos, when I want to uh, talk about the artwork, I'll look a little bit into the background of the artist, and maybe some of their other work to get some uh, comparisons into what their style is in general. And there's generally some interesting stories about how that comes along. So uh, the Earthsea books started to come out it's got a 50-year history now, so that's a lot of covers. So I wanted to just focus on the second book, uh, The Tombs of Atuan. But uh, in so many cases, the artists that illustrated the book covers for the, uh, the Tombs of Atuan also did covers for the other books in the series, too. And over the years, more and more books and collections of stories and things would come out. And then there were the uh, the American editions, the UK editions, other uh, editions around the world and different translations and things. And there's just a lot of artwork. So I was going to keep it just to the American uh, uh, work. And then just for uh, the Tombs of Atuan. Atuan. <laughs> Atuan. And uh, so, but that was taking quite a bit of time just because there's been so many years of uh, accumulating uh, illustrations for, for this book. So I was just starting to wrap this up uh, my research on that last night around midnight. And at the stroke of midnight, I got a visitation by the ghost of Ursula K. Le Guin herself. Because one of the books that I was 
researching was this giant tome here, which I bought a few years ago when I started reading uh, The Wizard of Earthsea. Uh, this is a, 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 uh, a collection of all the Earthsea stories in one volume, kind of an authorized volume with all new artwork, and it's fantastic. But I had never read the introduction to this until I was like I say, doing some research last night. And Ursula K. Le Guin says in her introduction that uh, she never really, after the first couple of books that came out back in the late 60s and early 70s, she never really liked any of the artwork that uh, all these great artists have been creating for the last five decades. And as I was reading that, I thought, well, damn, I've just done kind of my retrospective on all this stuff and is coming up with my thoughts for the video and all that. And I started to agree with her. So uh, I'm going <laughs> to pull back a little bit here. And uh, as, as I'll talk about when we talk about uh, my uh, chat about the story itself, um, that I found that uh, I've started to kind of get into the Earthsea series itself. And I think I'm going to continue. And as so, I'm going to put off doing this deep dive into the artwork until I've read all of the Earthsea stories, uh, and then I can go back and talk about the artwork, because these illustrators don't illustrate, in, in generally, just one book. They'll do a trilogy, or they'll do the first four books, or they'll do the entire collection and all that. So, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to focus just on the Tombs of Atuan, and uh, when it first came out, and then that one uh, illustration from that trilogy that I bought in 1975, because I always liked that artwork. I, I bought the trilogy back then because I really liked the cover art, and, and not because I was necessarily interested in reading the fantasy uh, stories, because I, I had the impression that they were children's fantasies, and that wasn't really my thing at the time. I was more of a science fiction guy. Still am, really. But the artwork was intriguing, and we'll talk about that. But uh, first, let's uh, let's go back and uh, talk just a little bit about how uh, Ursula K. Le Guin came to write the Earthsea stories, and a little bit about uh, that background. Ursula K. Le Guin was born in 1929 in Berkeley, California, and the letter K, her initial K, uh, stood for Krober. Her father was Alfred Krober, who was a leading anthropologist at UC Berkeley, and her mother was a psychologist. So Ursula grew up around academia, which uh, was a big influence on her thinking growing up as a young child, as well as obviously into her writing career uh, down the line. Uh, she grew up with three older brothers, and they all enjoyed reading science fiction and fantasy in the pulp magazines of the day. And Ursula was particularly fascinated with Norse mythology and, because of her father's anthropological studies, Native American lore and legend. Um, Alfred Krober was uh, a leading anthropologist in the study of Native Americans, and uh, that led to some controversy <laughs> down the line some years later. But that's another story. <clears throat> uh, Ursula enjoyed writing and telling stories from the age of five, and even at that young age, already considered herself to be a writer. And uh, so she started to make a career for herself uh, through the 50s and into the very early 60s of writing stories and poetry that could not get published. She struggled for quite a while doing that. But then finally in the early 60s, she started to get some of her science fiction stories published as well as a couple of fantasy stories, short stories that she wrote that focused on a magic system having to do with the power of names. And that later on grew into what could become the Earthsea series. By 1968, Le Guin was establishing a pretty good reputation for her writing, and Parnassus Press at that time was thinking about publishing a line of young adult fantasy books, and came to Le Guin and asked her if she could write a book for that line, and at first she thought, no, I, I can't do that. I don't write children's books. I don't write young adult books. I, I just... Don't, I don't do that. And she kind of panicked a little bit about it. And then she started to think, well, what makes 
an adolescent fantasy book. What is that anyway? And she decided that it was uh, just a matter of having an adolescent protagonist and thought that she could do that. So then she started to look back at her her own fantasy repertoire and uh, remembered a, a, those uh, two short stories that she had written some years before, The Word of Unbinding, that had been published in the uh, Fantastic Stories of the Imagination in January of 64, and then in the April 64 issue of the same magazine, The Rule of Names. And both of those short stories weren't intended to be part of a series or anything, but they did kind of establish in her magic system the power of knowing or understanding the true name of something. And so she took that idea and sat down and started to draw out a map. And uh, it was a, an, a, an archipelago, of a system of islands in this sea. So she called it Earth Sea and uh, started to put together the first book uh, of that series. And it wasn't intended to be a series at all. It was just a, a, going to be a one-off, uh, The Wizard of Earthsea. Her concept behind it was she was familiar with other uh, epic fantasy type of stories in which there were always wizards and dragons. And the wizards were generally um, venerable sages that uh, had had wisdom and could... Uh, 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 work all kinds of wonders and things like that. And her thought was, well, where do these, where do these old uh, wizened wizards come from anyway? And she came up with the idea of a wizard school and apparently was the first to do that. And so I guess we have in, in a big way, Ursula K. Le Guin to thank for Harry Potter. So she wrote The Wizard of Earthsea, and that's the book that I read a couple of years ago for the first time. And uh, just to touch on that a little bit, I was surprised that I enjoyed it as much. I thought it was going to be kind of a light and breezy story, which it, it was, but it did focus on uh, the adolescent uh, sorcerer or wizard, uh, Ged. Uh, his name was Sparrowhawk, and his true name uh, was Ged. And early in the story when he starts to learn how to use his powers at, at the school, uh, he's showing off one day and makes a horrible mistake and releases some shadowy, uh, ungodly uh, source of power, a creature that is is uh, just horribly wicked and just sets Earthsea on all kinds of problems and haunts him. And so... <clears throat> Because of this horrendous mistake, he spends the rest of the book trying to deal with that and solve that and set things to right. And that's that's the adventure. So at first, when I was reading that story, I didn't really like the guy. I didn't really care for Sparrowhawk, or Ged, as he came to be known. Um, didn't like the character, but of course, it's his story arc in, in dealing with his mistake and uh, uh, bringing that to a resolution. So you at least I came to enjoy him and appreciate him more by the end of the book. But that brings us to The Tombs of Atuan, which was first published in the winter 1970 to 71 issue of Worlds of Fantasy. And at that time, the women's liberation movement was huge, and Le Guin considered herself to be a feminist by nature, so a lot of those ideas uh, would find themselves into her fiction. And uh, Le Guin was also interested in some Taoist ideas and Buddhism. So they kind of worked themselves in, into the tombs of Atuan also. It was a story of a young girl who, at the age of five, is taken from her happy family and uh, uh, taken off to uh, Atuan, where she is to be raised from a little girl to take over the position of the one priestess of the nameless ones. So it's similar in a way to the Dalai Lama. The, the concept is that when the one priestess of the nameless ones dies, at the, the day and hour that she dies, there is born somewhere in the land a, a new young girl who is the reincarnation of the one princess. So there is... Uh, 
uh, kind of an army of priestesses that go out and scour the land to find the young girl who was born that same hour that uh, could be the uh, princess reincarnated. And so uh, it's the story of uh, Tenar, who is taken from her family at the age of five uh, off to the the temple uh, in the tombs of Atuan to be raised as uh, the, the next uh, one princess of the Nameless Ones. And uh, uh, so that is her story. So kind of similar in that she is raised into this world. And the thing that I, I found interesting about this was that as she grows uh, older and starts to take on more and more of the mantle of her duties, uh, she starts to question what she's really doing. Now, at first, I like in The Wizard of Mercy, I didn't care for the character because she starts off as a sweet little girl, and that's fine. But then once she starts getting schooled and brought up in this, she learns that uh, there are prisoners that are brought to her temple that periodically need to be uh, uh, killed. So they, they need to be executed. And so she has to oversee that. And I I wasn't getting into that too much. And so she also has a chip on her shoulder for a lot of things. And, and I just wasn't enjoying the character until she starts to have these dreams and starts to realize and think that this isn't right. She doesn't know who these prisoners are and doesn't really understand all of the, the religion and the philosophy behind what she's supposed to be doing. And Remembering that, of course, that she is supposed to be the reincarnated one princess of the nameless ones. And they're teaching her. They're having to teach her all the things that she supposedly did in all her past lives that she doesn't remember. So she's questioning this religion. And that's when it started to get interesting to me. And uh, she is given the, the power and authority over the labyrinth, which is below the... the uh, the tombs of Atuan. And uh, she is only allowed to explore that in, in pitch dark. There's no light allowed down there except for some very special rooms where she can take a lantern in there. But mostly she has to feel around in the dark, just the convolutions and carvings and things on the face of the walls, the tunnels. Those are her only landmarks and her ways of finding uh her way around and there are miles and miles of tunnels down there and there are treasure rooms and uh, the nameless ones rule over this supposedly and they allow her to go through all of this uh, 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 without any trouble because she is the the uh, one princess of the nameless ones. Anyone else down there is supposedly uh, tortured and executed and put to death and all kinds of horrible things to happen to her. So it's that story uh, of this girl's uh, coming to age uh, story, obviously, and then also kind of coming to realization that the things that she's been raised to believe are either bad or not true, or both. And so it's that journey, similar to The Wizard of Earthsea, where uh, our our male protagonist has a kind of a comeuppance, and so does she, likewise, in The Tombs of Atuan. So, uh, by the end of reading this book, I started to feel like, okay, I read the first book a couple of years ago just because it's always been on the shelf and I always meant to get to it and I finally did. And then the second book, uh, I only went back to Earthsea again for February fantasy stories. And it was a, a, a to kind of uh, complete uh, one of the uh, prompts for, for the BookTube event. Uh, by the end of the book, I started to feel like, well, now I'm kind of invested and I want to find out what happens to her and what happens to Ged from the first book and travel on. And then once I got into uh, researching about all the artwork and things and, and finding out uh, what Ursula K. Le Guin herself thought of them and just being intrigued by all of that stuff, I want to continue. So somewhere down the line, I will I will do some some uh, approach somehow to the entire Earthsea series once I finished reading them all and look at the artwork for the for the whole thing. Right now, we're just going to look at the one book, 
uh, the uh, tombs of Atuan. So let's take a look at some of the artwork that was produced back in those days and not worry about the 50 years since. So let's take a look at this first cover. This is cover art by Jack Gaughan, one of my favorite illustrators back in the 60s and 70s. He did a lot of work on, uh, actually for, through the 50s as well, on a lot of the science fiction and fantasy uh, pulps and digests of the day. And uh, it, the same artwork was picked up for Spawn of Satan, a collection of mystery stories by Charles Birkin, and, which I have never read, by the way. But I did look up a description of the title story in, in this book, collection, Spawn of Satan, which seems to have nothing to do with any of the imagery in the Jack Gaughan illustration at all. So I'm sure it was just picked up because it was published at about the same time. The artwork was available and maybe it captured a, a mood of some of the stories in there and they just didn't want to pay for any original illustration. But the artwork does wonderfully, I think, depict the opening scenes of uh, the Tombs of Atuan. Now, the version that was printed in Worlds of Fantasy here uh, is a little shorter and a little bit different than the book version. Le Guin had gone back for the book and padded out, I don't want to say padded out, fleshed out some of the earlier portions of the story and little bits here and there throughout uh, to give a little more context and uh, maybe just to, just to work in some some important details that uh, uh, maybe for word count reasons or something were left out of the initial publication. But in the in the artwork here, we are seeing these two uh, these two hooded figures here. That is the one princess Arha, which is Tanar, grown up now. She has become Arha, the one priestess. Priestess. I keep saying princess. Priestess. And she is being led there by the high priestess of the god king, Castle, who is a kind of a, a jealous, I want to say, like a like a an evil stepmother type character to uh, Arha or Tanar, uh, but she is uh, responsible for teaching Tanar a, a lot of the things in the religion, and in this case, she is taking her to uh, to first open up the door to the labyrinth of tunnels beneath the tombs of of uh, Atuan. And those big finger-like stones there are the tombs of Atuan. That's uh, uh, on top of the, built on top of the ground over the tunnels. And uh, the story depicts them as being seven monolithic finger-like stones, two of which have been tumbled down, which we don't really see here. Now, one of the great things about Jack Gaughan's artwork is that whenever you see him illustrating something, you can be pretty sure that he read the source material. So when he's illustrating something, it's usually a pretty good depiction of something that's actually in the story and not just making things up. So that's one of the reasons I really like his work. He also did an interior illustration for the Tombs of Atuan. And here we see a really nice pen and ink illustration that takes place later in the story. This is down in the labyrinths, and we see the, the two figures there, the lead character there with, it looks like a torch, but it's actually a magical staff. That is Ged, the Wizard of Earthsea from the first book. He has come to the labyrinths uh, because he has, uh, it's one of those loose ends from the end of the first book that is trying to be resolved now in this. There has been something stolen uh, in, the, in the dim, dark past, a uh, magical uh, item, let's say, that uh, is now he knows is in the treasury down in the labyrinths. And at one point, Tanar has found him down there and has kind of taken him prisoner and uh, is being somewhat cruel to him and, until they start talking about things. And uh, there's kind of a, a turning point at, uh, at a certain point in, in Tanar's character where she is starting to realize that a lot of the things... Actually, she's kind of been on the road to realizing this anyway. So this was a, a fortuitous meeting here in a lot of ways that uh, uh, now they are trying to seek escape from this world and this life and get out of the, the catacomb. So the tunnels that are usually in pitch blackness now he's using his light so that they can find their way through and we can finally see revealed a lot of the, the 
walls and things that Tanar has only known up until now by touch and not really have seen what these these shapes on the walls actually are. So really interesting there. Uh, uh, just a nice use of uh, black and white there. Very moody. One of the things you can never really seem to get away from in a lot of epic fantasy stories are maps. And there are a couple of maps in this issue that uh, are uncredited, but I still believe that they were illustrated by Jack Gaughan. Let's take a look at them. The map on the left is of the Kargid lands, and uh, Atuan is one of the islands in that smaller little uh, group of islands in the larger world of Earthsea. Uh, the, uh, all of these little parts here in this map are talked about in the tombs of Atuan. The rest of Earthsea only kind of alluded to because Ged is from there and he tells some some stories, but it the geography doesn't matter so much as as this. And then <clears throat> on the right side we have a a map of the labyrinth, all the convoluted tunnels and things that are under the hill beneath the temple and below the tombs of Atuan. And uh, one of the reasons that I believe that Jack Gunn did these is because he did a lot of similar kinds of things, and he had a, a particular style of calligraphy that we see here that we don't see in other versions of these maps. And uh, so I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb once again and accredit these maps to Jack Gaughan. And speaking of Jack Gaughan, let's take a look at uh, a little bit of his background here, and maybe we can uh, get an idea of why he was such an important illustrator back in those days. Jack Gaughan was born in 1930, and he grew up in Springfield, Ohio, and he got his start illustrating book covers for Fantasy Publishing Company, but he really hit his stride working for Galaxy Magazine starting in the mid-1950s. And by the winter of 1970, the issue of the Tombs of Atuan that we're talking about here, by the time that hit the newsstands, Gon had become the associate art director for the entire line of Universal Publishing and Distribution's fleet of magazines, which included Galaxy Magazine, probably their flagship science fiction magazine of the day, Worlds of If... Worlds of Tomorrow, and Worlds of Fantasy, which is uh, the issue we're talking about here. Now, when Gunn accepted the position as associate art director for all these magazines, all under one roof, he thought that he was going to have the, uh, the ability and the authority to assign projects to a lot of uh, freelance illustrators, and that his position might be largely editorial in nature, at least as far as artwork goes. Uh, but he quickly found that he was working with very tight deadlines and very tight budget. So he wound up doing almost all of the artwork himself. And as an example, let me just show you all of the interior black and white illustrations he did for that very same issue of Worlds of Fantasy that the Tombs of Atuan appeared in. Now, as I said, he had limited time and budget, and don't forget, he read all of the material that he was doing illustrations for, so he had very little time and a lot of work to do, so he found some uh, some styles that he could work in that kind of worked in shortcuts, and uh, as these kind of scroll by the screen here, you might be able to see that in a lot of cases, he just let the, the pencil sketching underneath the drawings, the pen and ink drawings, show through. And in some cases, he just went with just the pencil sketches dark enough that they would reproduce to be printed in black and white. But uh, aside from the cover and interior illustration of the Tombs of Aton that we already saw, by my count here, he did another seven illustrations throughout this issue. And that was just the black and white illustrations for that one magazine that one month. And so don't forget, he's working on, on several other magazines and not just under the same publication house, but he would be commissioned to do covers for other publications and other paperbacks as well. For instance, these are the color covers that he did just that one month. All these were out on the newsstands and book racks at the same time. So obviously on the left is our Worlds of Fantasy that had the Tombs of Atuan in it that he did the cover and uh, the in interior illustration for. And then the Worlds of If, Galaxy, and the Worlds of Tomorrow all across the top there 
all under the same publishing house that he was the uh, associate art director for. He also did the color cover for the magazine of fantasy and science fiction from another publishing house. And then for another publishing house, he did these two in the lower right paperback covers here. And that's all I could find. He may have actually done some other ones. I just didn't find them. Not to mention that those three magazines across the top there, the Worlds of If, Worlds of Tomorrow, and Galaxy magazine, he was doing all the interior illustrations for those as well. And again, like I said, those were all on the shelves at one month, but he did this for over 20 years, so you can see why he's considered such an important science fiction and fantasy illustrator of those days. Man, what a show-off. But uh, So that's the magazine appearance of it, which brings us to the first edition of the book of the Tombs of Atuan, uh, which just came out just a few months later in June of 1971. Published by Athenaeum, this used artwork by Gail Garrity, who was continuing the tradition that was established by Ruth Robbins in the first edition of The Wizard of Earthsea. She was the illustrator for that. And she created a series of chapter headers of spot illustrations that ran throughout the book, each capturing an important incident or aspect chapter by chapter that gave the book a really nice storytelling experience. And her drawings were kind of a combination of stained glass windows and woodcut illustrations that really matched the mood for me, I think for a lot of people, for Earthsea. And Gail Garrity continued that in this. And one of the spot illustrations she did throughout the book was then used for the cover. And here we see Ged uh, holding his magical staff of light there, which they use to find their way in and out of all the tunnels of the labyrinth there. And it's a, it's a very nice illustration indicative of the entire series, but I think they missed the mark here. For me, I think that instead of showing Ged, who is the protagonist of The Wizard of Earthsea, the Tombs of Atuan is really Tanar's story. She should have been on the cover of here, or maybe at least maybe the two of them together or something. But he had his book. Now this is her book, and I think they just selected the wrong illustration. But uh, let me show you those illustrations here just real quick. You can just see the number of them and the, get, get a feel for uh, exactly how they could carry you through the book. And I think one of the key differences between the, the Gail Garrity illustrations that we're looking at here and the Ruth Robbins uh, that I mentioned before which were kind of a cross between a stained glass window and a woodcut. Uh, Gail Garrity, very similar style, but to me these are less stained glass and maybe more tarot card-like or something. But uh, either way, uh, any of those combinations really fit the mood for Earthsea, I think. And uh, here at the beginning, we see the little uh, five-year-old girl as she's taken away by the priestesses from her happy home at the beginning. Uh, and then throughout the story... Um, uh, it's interesting to me, I, when I was putting this page together here, I noticed that the final two frames there, if you look through all of the illustrations uh, together, that they're all, most of the book takes place in just the dark catacombs and labyrinths and, and dark crumbling temples and throne rooms and, and things of the tombs of Atuan, until we get to these final two spot illustrations here, which are not framed in a big, heavy black uh border here. They're more open and airy as uh, Ged and Tanar have left Atuan and are now out into the rest of the world of Earthsea. So it's a, a just a nice little touch, I felt, for these. And what would an Earthsea book be without a map or maps? And in this case, once again, we have uncredited maps. And uh, I believe that there are some telltale signs here that they are, in fact, drawn or redrawn by Gail Garrity, who did all the uh, the little chapter headings, and uh, so let's let's take a look here. And I put up the who I believe is the Jack Gon map from the magazine version on the left for comparison, and I believe the Gail Garrity version uh, in the middle there. If you look closely, you can see that all the uh, little curls and and wiggles and and shapes and directions of the tunnels in the labyrinth are the same, but they've been redrawn, and just in a broad stroke, you can see that 
the map itself is a little shorter and wider. Also, we don't have what I think is the Jack Gone calligraphy down the side there, and all the rooms and chambers and tunnels and things have been uh, re-lettered. So it's different artwork. It's clearly different artwork. And then in the magazine, we had a map of the islands of the area around Atuan, the Kargid lands. And we don't have that in the book, but instead we get a diagram of the place of the tombs itself under which uh, are the tunnels of the labyrinth. So you can find your way around to all the different temples and buildings and throne rooms and the, the tombs themselves there. And then the telltale sign to me is that compass rose down on the bottom left of that map, which really looks to me like the same hand that drew all those uh, woodcut drawings of the chapter headings by Gail Garrity. So uh, I think we can safely attribute this artwork, these maps, to her. And then I was trying to find a little background on Gail Garrity just to see what her story was, and she's actually done very little, at least very little that I can find. But uh, I did find a few things, and she definitely has a style. On the far left here, we can see her cover art for the first edition of The Farthest Shore, which was the third book in the Earthsea trilogy. And uh, as I mentioned before, Ursula K. Le Guin had uh, said that she didn't really like much of the illustration that had been done for her books over the years. Now, these first three books by, uh, uh, by Gail Garrity and by Ruth Robbins were the exception. Uh, Le Guin really liked the artwork for those, and she really liked that that woodcut treatment here. So Gail Garrity was a natural for that. So uh, it's good to know that uh, Le Guin herself approved of the artwork of these editions at least. And then uh, you can see a couple of other examples of things that I found by Gail Garrity. There's not a lot out there that at least that I could find, but the one in the middle there was for a cookbook and uh, a couple of the interior illustrations that she had for those. Maybe they were recipes or something. I'm not really sure. I don't have that book. But her style is unmistakable, I think. And then uh, finally on the far right, we have a book cover that she did for a, a Shirley Jackson story. And uh, that was all I could find on her. I wish there were more examples out there. Maybe there are, but uh, that's all I could find. Uh, she sure seemed to like those... Uh, those uh, purples and golds, though, seems to be running through all of her work. And that brings us to the third and final illustrator that I'll talk about in this video, and that's Pauline Ellison. And even though she is one of the illustrators that Le Guin called out that of the artwork that she did not care for for Earthsea, um, it is the series of book covers that got me to buy the trilogy in the first place. Back in 1975, I remember buying it at... Wonderworld Books, which was a comic book store mostly, but they also carried all the new science fiction and fantasy paperbacks and uh, some hardcovers back in those days uh, as they were coming out, as well as all the fanzines and science fiction magazines and science fiction movie magazines, all that kind of a stuff. The, the store was run by Richard Kyle, who was a great guy and a big fan, obviously, of science fiction and fantasy, of all that kind of thing. And he's credited with having coined the term uh, a graphic novel. So it was, uh, I didn't find that out until years later. But, oh, that's Richard. that was Richard, the guy from uh, Wonder World that we always would go every week uh, to buy our new comics. And oh, I've got so many paperbacks. from This being a series of them here. And so uh, let's talk about uh, these covers. Just focusing here to begin with on the tombs of Atuan, uh, one of the things I really liked about these covers, and they all came out within a month or so of each other, so I think I bought them all at once. And the thing that intrigued me about them was not just the fanciful illustration style, but the fact that they were wraparound covers. And that, was, that intrigued me in those days. I was a graphic design student at Cal State Fullerton in those days and was looking to be an illustrator uh, once I got my degree. And so things like this seemed innovative to me at the time. Now, as I said before, I did not read this. I only read Tombs of Atuan here just uh, over the last few weeks here. Uh, I have not ever read it since I bought this back ha, 50 years ago, whatever that was, um, in, in, until recently. So I didn't know the problems that this artwork actually has. Um, and uh, certainly uh, not uh, understanding why Ursula K. Le Guin herself did not like it. 
But uh, one of the problems that I see now that I have read the story is, and I can kind of understand why, is that we see on the cover, we see Tanar in the boat sailing the seas of Earth Sea with the giant castled island behind it there. And uh, that's just not really indicative of the story. Most of this book, 95% of the story, I would say, takes place on Atuan, and 80% of that takes place in the labyrinth tunnels down in the dark in the earth below. So I think what happened is the illustrator here, uh, Pauline Ellison, uh, had to tie it in with the other two books in the trilogy, which were all set at sea. And one of the cool things that I really liked about this all these years before having read any of them is that not only was the individual book a wraparound cover, but all three of the original trilogy, those were all the books that were out at that time, that there were to be other books later, but even all of they linked together when you spread them all out back to front, front to back. Just that neat little idea of that splash or column of, of ocean water that's washing up between the, the spines and the edges of, of each panel of the books. If you put all those together, uh, it tells the story of all three books in a row there. So I really like that and have kept these all these years just because of that, not really realizing the problems that uh, it had with the actual story. Did I say all of they? Uh, I, sorry, I apologize for that. I've been having pronoun problems lately. But the other cool thing about these books is not only if you spread them out back to front, front to back, but just if you took just the front covers alone and set them next to each other, because of that uh, interstitial wave splash there, uh, just the the front covers work together nicely. So I think that was great. And But I do see one of the things that uh, Ursula K. Le Guin was talking about, that she did mention that she thought that these illustrations were pretty amongst themselves. But the problem that she had with them were the types of castles and things, these kind of uh, uh, Mad Ludwig Neuschwanstein style Disneyland castles with the with the pretty pointy turrets and the flags waving and all that was not her earthy. She had a much grittier earthy style in mind, more of like a uh, I would say like a Bronze Age style of uh, uh, of technology and things. So uh, all these kind of fairy tale, uh, fanciful, whimsical castles and and such. Uh, were not what uh, Le Guin had in mind as she was writing them. Now, before we go, let's take a quick look at Pauline Ellison herself and see where she comes from. She was born in 1946 in Keithley, Yorkshire, England, and she studied at the Bradford, Leicester, and Cambridge schools of art, so she was pretty well educated in uh, the line of illustration. Most of her commercial work uh, depicted children's fantasy scenes, and uh, I love this photo. She even looks like a Waterhouse painting herself somehow. She was primarily an illustrator for newspapers and magazines, but she did a lot of illustration also for advertising, packaging, greeting cards, and of course, book covers. And uh, let's just take a quick look at a handful of some of her uh, fantasy style work. One of the things that bugged Ursula K. Le Guin was when her publishers would tell her that uh, don't worry so much about the artwork, uh, even though it's not uh, depicting what you think Earthsea should look like. Uh, we know what sells books, so uh, we're going we're gonna to have illustrations on the covers that we know will work, and uh, you're going to make money at that. That just that bugged Le Guin, and so uh, after a while, she just quit getting involved in dealing with uh, the, the art departments for the, the publishers. She just was just so annoyed. But as far as Pauline Ellison herself goes, uh, Bantam, at least, who published these three uh, Earthsea trilogy books that we've been talking about here, uh, they loved her. And in fact, they went back to her a few more times for some other Ursula K. Le Guin uh, book covers. Uh, the first one there, the big one on the left, another wraparound cover there, uh, was uh, another book in the Earthsea cycle, as it came to be called after <laughs> more than three books were written. And then uh, another uh, Ursula K. Le Guin uh, book there up in the uh, top row. And then uh, a series 
of covers for uh, Elizabeth Scarborough's Song Killer Saga that came out in the early 90s, which are uh, quite colorful and nice. I kind of like those. Again, haven't read any of these books here, so I don't know how close she's coming to uh, matching the storytelling in those, but I do like her artwork. So, I hope to continue with my own exploration of Earthsea on down the line, and uh, we'll see if uh, maybe it, it uh, warrants any further videos, uh, probably in installments uh, like the books themselves, uh, to cover all, uh, all the artwork that uh, Ursula K. Le Guin did like. <laughs> let's focus on that next time. And uh, so just before we go, let's take a quick look at the three book covers that uh, we did talk about. And then let me know in the comments down below if you have a favorite of these three or uh, if you have a favorite Earthsea book or uh, if just you like the series in general. And uh, let's let's chat about Earthsea a little bit more. Uh, as, as I've mentioned, I'm new to the series and am, now that I'm two books into it, I'm looking forward to more. And there you have it. Uh, thanks for spending this time with me. If you're an Earthsea fan, then hopefully you enjoyed this video. And if you're an art fan and not an Earthsea fan, maybe it was worth your while. Anyway, I sure had fun doing it and researching it. And I took a few uh, left turns or wrong turns down the uh, those uh, labyrinth catacombs myself. Uh, but uh, I've made it to the light of day here and I'm trying to share what I've discovered with you. So uh, I know you've got uh, some other books that you've got to read yourself. I'll let you get back to those, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks a lot.